Welcome to Milroy United Methodist Church. I sincerely thank you for joining us today for worship. It's gonna be a modified worship. I'm doing it from the parsonage actually. And I applaud you for being here. First, I have a couple announcements to share with you. Um, we, you will receive a letter this week with some instructions. During our intentional discipleship workshop, remember we had like nine people go, actually we had more than that. And afterwards, we were really impressed with the workshop and there's something that's part of the workshop we want you to do. There's a real discipleship survey. And by having everybody in the church take it, yes, we want everyone in the church to take it, it's gonna give us a better idea of where we are, where we are in the church, what do we need to provide for people to help them continue to grow in their discipleship? So that's why we're asking everybody to take it. There's more details in the letter that'll come and it has a link in there. So I ask each of you to please take that. I won't know what your results are. I just see the aggregate where it kind of comes up together and says, okay, this is, you've got you know, 50% in this category, 25 in this category. And it just tells us where are we at in our worship? Where are we at? in our path with Jesus, where are we at in these different categories? It'll really help us. So we're asking you to please do that. Once again, the letter has all the details. Also confirmation. I really wanna have a confirmation class this spring, but I have to do it pretty fast if I'm gonna do it. So I need to know who is interested. I know we have about seven to 12 youth that have engaged in the church in some way or another that would be qualified to take confirmation class. But I need you to express interest. I need the parent or the child to reach out to me and say, yes, I wanna be in that confirmation class. My reason I'm being so cautious here is, the last confirmation class we did wasn't the smallest one I've ever done. We had two people in it. That's too small. It's not fun. You can't play games. It's difficult to do all the stuff that's great in confirmation that really kind of helps drive it home. So if you have a child or if you are a youth that wants to be in confirmation, please let me know right away because I have to get a lot of things together to do a confirmation. This takes a lot of work before we even begin. So I don't want to begin and not be able to finish in time. So if I don't find out soon I have enough people, then I will just make a list of all the youth and then when I give my turnover to the next pastor, I'll just kind of explain who they are and where they are and, hey, they need to go through confirmation. So uh, please get a hold of me soon if uh, your child would like to be part of the confirmation class that I'd like to have this spring. Okay, now this is that time when we kind of stop and we settle down, get comfortable in our seats and really prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. So please prepare them as we go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, light from light who commands the universe and all that is made. Your word is the power that makes whole what is broken, the force of good and the food of peace. Teach us now as you taught in the synagogue. Heal us now so that all that we say and do, the freedom that we have in you, may be for others too. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. We're going to go to our scripture next. And our scripture starts in Psalm 111. Psalm 111. Sorry, I had to get my Bible out here. Psalm 111, 1 through 2, and then 10. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord of my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Then we move to the New Testament, and our New Testament lesson today is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 
1 through 9 and 13. And I want you to really pay attention because there's places in here where things are in quotes. So I'm going to let you know when it's in quotes because it's important to understand that's the pieces where Paul, we think, Paul is quoting a letter that he received from the Corinthians. You have to understand in Greek manuscript, quotation marks don't exist. So this is through translation, what they thought was something that he was probably quoting from a letter, okay? So I'll let you know when I'm quoting, that is a quotation coming from the letter, okay? Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact, there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, the one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. Their conscience be as weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In our scripture today, this is a really, really good example of why you don't read the Bible literally. You don't just read it and say, well, that's what it says, because there's a lot of interpretation here. There's a lot of background you need to know to understand what they're talking about. Because Paul's point of this letter isn't about meat. Meat kind of helps drive to the point. Meat sacrificed to idols, that is. But his main point is we are not entirely free in Christ until we're willing to forego our freedom so that we're not a stumbling block to another. It's more than just meat. But before we begin, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a few stories for you because I think it'll help tie this together. Um, I have a friend, believe it or not, who's terrified of escalators. She's older than I, and um, it's normally not a problem for her to be scared of escalators. She's afraid that foot's gonna get stuck, her clothing's gonna get stuck, it doesn't matter, she gets scared. Well, once we were on a trip in Washington, DC, her grandson was in the orchestra and my son was in the orchestra. So she and I went on a trip, Washington, DC. And I knew she had this fear of escalators. A lot of the buildings you go in in Washington, D.C. use escalators. That's the fastest way to get from one floor to another, especially when you're moving with a group of people. But she's scared of escalators, terrified. She really feels she's going to fall and get hurt. So we had two choices. Either I could join the group, the kids, and go on up the escalator and leave her there all alone. And knowing her, she probably would not have went around and tried to find an elevator somewhere. She just went back to the bus and just waited and said, I guess I'm going to miss this one. Or I could choose to forego my freedom and help her find an elevator and ride the elevator with her to our destination. I had a choice. I chose to forego my freedom. 
I chose to not be with the, the group, not be with all these kids that I was having a blast with, and to go find an elevator with her every single building we went to. We did that together. I loved her more than my knowledge that it didn't make sense why she didn't like escalators. Second, let me tell you a story about, you know, and this actually happens to me because I do have some friends who are um, recovering alcoholics, okay? And sometimes we will go with a group to a restaurant. Sometimes it was work back when I worked for HP or with other things. And if I wanted to have a glass of wine at dinner, it could be a problem for my friend who is a recovering alcoholic because then that was a temptation to him to belong. And it was already a temptation anyway. I had two choices. When you have this situation, you have two choices. Do you go ahead and get that glass of wine you just really wanted to have for your meal that evening? Because you know, alcohol, alcoholism wasn't my problem, right? Or do I just go ahead and order like a glass of iced tea instead? I like tea, what's the big deal? If I choose a non-alcoholic drink, then I'm foregoing my freedom. Kind of get the point? I'm foregoing my freedom to order anything I want so I won't be a stumbling block to another. That makes sense? Okay, here's a third story. I think you'll really like this because I love this man. At a prior church I had, I walked every Sunday to the church just across the parking lot from the parsonage to the front door of the church. Now you need to understand in this church, other doors to get in the church, you had to go way around the building and sometimes not even have a sidewalk in the snow in the winter and things in order to get into another door. And to be honest, I don't even know if I had a key to those doors. I always went in the main door, just didn't really worry about it too much. Well, the technology director and I were two people who usually came first to the church. It's a great guy, really liked Bill. Matter of fact, that, that thing on my desk that has like an A-frame, Bill made that, okay? Great guy. He and I would get there early because I had preparation to do, and he always would work on the slides, make sure all the sound was turned on, everything was where it needed to be, okay? But then he'd go outside and he would smoke. And that's about the time that I'm coming in towards the church. He stood outside the church and he would be, you know, welcoming people as they came in as he's enjoying his cigarette. But he stood right at the entrance of the church. Many of you may not know this. I've probably mentioned it before. I'm allergic to a few things. I want to smoke really bad. If I would go through a plume of smoke going into a building within a couple hours, I'm going to be pretty miserable. If I had went in through the plume of smoke going into the church, I'd probably make it to the service, but the rest of my day was going to be pretty crappy because my head would be hurting. I'd have all this congestion. I'm just allergic to smoke. It's just what it is. Believe me, I've been trying to get over these allergies. Um, so what he noticed was when I would come up to the church, I would always kind of, you know, wave at him, say, hey, how you doing, Bill? And then I would go around to get around the smoke, wherever it was, and then go into the building. Now this went on for a little while, okay? Then one day he realized what I was doing. He said, why, why are you avoiding me? I said, Bill, I'm not avoiding you. Dude, I'm allergic to smoke. I can't be going through that, that plume of smoke. But at the same time, you have the right to smoke out here. We have no signs saying you have to be eight foot away from the from the entrance or anything like that. You, mean, you, you have a right to be able to come out here and smoke. I just can't be in it. And he probably didn't really realize anybody else who had that allergy that maybe was just new to Christianity and, and investigating, they probably turned around and left if they saw that smoke at the front of the building. So what did he do? Bill had two choices, like the other ones we talked about. He had two choices. He could have just went ahead and kept doing it and said, it's your problem, not mine. Work around it, walk around it. But you know, he didn't. Do you know what Bill did? Bill scooted out several feet and kind of around a corner. He still could wave at people and say hello, but I could always walk in without smoke around me. He chose to forego his freedom 
because that was a freedom he had to be able to smoke right there in front of the building to smoke anywhere outside in order to not be a stumbling block for me. That's showing love to your sibling in Christ. So now back to our scripture, and I hope this helps you understand a little bit more, okay? Corinth, I want you to kind of understand where Corinth was. Think of Greece right now, where Greece is, okay? Corinth would have been down towards the bottom of Greece. And the way Greece is laid out is like, you know, think of Athens, okay? Here's Athens. And if you go west of Athens and down, there's a peninsula down there, okay? But there's a little piece of land, a little infamous that connects where Athens was to this peninsula. This is important because this is where Corinth is. Now, why this is important is that little piece of land was narrow enough that they had figured out how to take ships over it. I'm not joking, ships over land to cross that little piece of land because it was faster and safer to take it across that little piece of land and go back into the sea than it was to go around that peninsula. So this became a major trade center. Corinth was a huge trade center and it had about every possible God you can think of. All these idols, all these temples. And so it was really common for them to have idol worship. And it was very common to have sacrifices. You would have a sacrifice to whatever idol they were sacrificing to and it wasn't unusual for whoever the priest was or whatever for that religion or whatever it could be, would get a piece of the sacrifice. And often the person who came and brought the meat to be sacrificed got to take some of it back with them. Well, the people who got it and take home with them would just take home with them. But the, the priests and stuff sometimes would get so much meat, they would go ahead and resell it and it'd be resold in the marketplace. That was a lot of meat. So a lot of the meat that was in the marketplace that you could go buy had actually been sacrificed to idols, okay? So this is a big deal because this was just this culture of how that worked and how it worked with sacrificed meat, okay? So imagine going to Kroger and going to get groceries and all the meat there, except for maybe 5% of it, had been sacrificed to idols before. And they didn't have like this little section of non-sacrificed meat. It was just all mixed in. When you bought it, you didn't know if it was going to be sacrificed to an idol or it had been sacrificed to an idol or not. You didn't know. It wasn't like you go ring the bell at the meat counter and say, excuse me, do you know what this was sacrificed to? Go, I don't know. It's just meat. Then you move on. But then you also have to understand another piece. See, this is complicated, isn't it? I told you it was gatherings in Corinth, a lot of the villas and homes really didn't have big halls or big rooms that they could do gatherings. If you want to have a birthday gathering, you rented a temple space. If you wanted to have a wedding, you rented a space. I mean, these temples had these gathering rooms off of them. So you just use those. Very similar to people rent our church for birthday parties or for get togethers. You know, you just rented the space. But then that meant that they were having dinners, civic clubs, business gatherings, things like that, in a temple for an idol, okay? Religions, politics, daily life. You gotta understand all this was all tied together very tightly. So here Paul enters this world, okay? Christians only serve Christ. They don't worship idols. They don't sacrifice to idols. Like I said, it'd be like having a wedding in Rushville and you only could hold the reception in a temple that was dedicated to Satan. And all the food that you would have had to come from their Satan worship. There, now you kind of get that a little bit. Or it's like going home for your weekly groceries and you really have no idea what you just bought was sacrificed to Satan or not. It kind of help get you kind of understand what I mean by what this situation is like. But then there's actually a bigger problem, believe it or not. Okay, um, some of the Corinthian Christians wanted to be included. They wanted to be part of the in crowd. So they kind of wanted to be able to keep one foot 
in this old life of temple worship and idol worship and things, and one foot in following Christianity, okay? Because in order to move up in society there, you kind of needed to attend some of these gatherings, especially for business meetings or civic groups. There was key things you need to be in the in crowd to do, okay? If you wanted to have a business dinner, they use the temple. If you want to be included in any kind of a society thing, they use the temple. So they wrote to Paul enlisting help. Now I need to understand there's kind of two camps on this, but one of them kind of leans towards they're enlisting Paul to say, come on, we know idols aren't real. So it's okay if we do this, right? What harm is there? What harm is there in doing that? Because we know they're not real. And that's where you see the quotation marks in the scripture, where they're writing to him, more or less saying, oh, we know it's really not right, but it's no harm, right? Well, some of the Christians refused to eat the meat. And some Christians refused to go into those temples into those gathering places. They felt it wasn't in alignment with Christianity. And the ones most at risk were those new to Christianity because they were still trying to find their way. And this became really confusing for them if you've got these temples that they were going into and this meat that they were going into. So they're kind of like, I don't really understand how it is to be a Christian. And you know, I just don't know if I really want to follow that. But Paul's answer he, that he gave them, as usual, isn't what they wanted, not at all. Paul instead told the people who wrote to them that they had to change. He wasn't gonna just condone this. You guys have gotta change because you're missing the point. This is not about knowledge. This is about being loving to one another. His point was, if it can cause harm to another, don't do it. If meat sacrificed to idols, could lead people away, don't eat it. If eating in the temple could make someone question their Christian faith, well, then don't do it. They didn't like that answer because remember, they're wanting to move up in society. They're wanting to be included, not excluded. And this is impeding their ability to do that. Now, instead of using their superior knowledge, to convince themselves that they can do as they wish, he's saying, use it to help others. Don't be a stumbling block. In verse nine, verse nine, he writes, for it is written in the law of Moses, oops, sorry, wrong place. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. When he means weak here, he means people who are still trying to understand what Christianity is about, okay? Kind of relates to me, to me, like a, a, an alcohol person who's in um, recovery for alcoholism and who is still struggling every single day to not take a drink, okay? So back to our illustration, you know, think of that story about my friend that was afraid of escalators. Paul would be saying, Go help them find an elevator, even if it excludes you from the group for a while, or even if it makes you as a target for ridicule. The kids would make fun of you, the fact that you can't get on escalators. Oh. Or the story about dining with a recovering alcoholic. Just choose a non-alcoholic drink that night is what Paul would have said. Even if it singles you out from the crowd or makes you look weak to the boss at a business dinner. Do it anyway because you don't want to be a stumbling block for your friend. And like my friend Bill, who smoked each and every Sunday in front of the church, just move further away from the door so your pastor wasn't in misery on Sunday. Or so that someone new to Christianity who was still searching didn't find a reason to get back in their car. But you know, those are easy sacrifices to make, aren't they? We battle some really tough battles that impacts us personally today in these areas. Like the Corinthians, 
foregoing our freedoms for the sake of another Christian could mean you wouldn't be with the in, in crowd. It means that you could be excluded, not invited anymore. You could be a target for ridicule. So what's that mean to us today? Now picture our world today, and we may not have wooden figures that we go, you know, go bow to as idols. We may not sacrifice meat to an idol. We may not have you know, gatherings in a temple to an idol. But we actually still are in a similar situation if you think about it. We make choices every day to reaffirm what we think we know without considering how it can harm another or lead another away from Christ because we know it's true. So they just need to get over it. Actually, if you say those words, they need to get over it. You may want to go back and think about 1 Corinthians. Because, you know, I can't help but wonder how different would our world be? Honestly, how different would it be if we caught ourselves when we think we have superior knowledge? When we say the words, I know, I'll be honest, this week I've really watched every time I wrote the word, I know, or said, I know. Because then I asked, do I really know? Do I really know their situation? Instead, I need to stop and understand that person who I thought lacks knowledge. Why are they scared of an escalator? How different would our world be if we stopped to really ask the question, do I really know? Remember Paul's point, we are not entirely free in Christ until we are willing to forego our freedom to not be a stumbling block to another. So my prayer this week is for each of us to question ourselves each time we firmly believe we know something. I invite each of us to think of that woman who was fearful to get on an escalator because, you know, once I dug deeper, I realized she wasn't sure-footed. And to, to maneuver getting her feet onto an escalator really was a fall risk for her. You may know, know the escalator is safe for me but I didn't know at the time it really wasn't safe for her. Forgo your freedom to not be a stumbling block to another is what Paul told us. But back to that story of that friend of mine who was recovering from alcohol. Well, maybe you get together with some people who recover from alcohol, drugs, food addiction, any kind of addiction. And consider the challenge every day that they face, that when you do something in front of them, let's say someone who's trying to lose weight and you wanna go eat a piece of cake, or drinking a glass of wine in front of an alcoholic, when you don't realize that every ounce of energy that it takes that day for them to push back a desire to drink, forgo your freedom to not drink so you're not a stumbling block to another. Or like my friend Bill, who chose to move to another part of the parking lot. It was cold out there sometimes. So I could enter the church without triggering my allergies. He was free in Christ because he was willing to forego his freedom. So he wouldn't be a stumbling block to me or to anybody who's in that parking lot trying to talk themselves into get out of their car and go in the building. Each time we think we have superior knowledge, each time we think we know something, that's when it's a good time to go back to 1 Corinthians and remember, we're not entirely free in Christ until we're willing to forego that freedom. So we're not a stumbling block to somebody else. Isn't that beautiful? To actually stop and realize I have freedom, but I have the choice also to not use it at times. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in praise. Lord, we are so grateful for all the ways that you work in our lives, all the ways that you show us how to love one another, all the ways that we can be there for one, to one another, all the ways we can see the freedom you have given us. And that freedom includes the option to not use it at times. Lord, guide us and make us bold as we go out into the world this week. Help us to evaluate our actions. Help us to be courageous enough to stop and say, I think I know, but do I really? And then listen to another. Lord, we thank you for how your word guides us all the time. And we thank you for this letter from Paul. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Have a good week. Stay warm. Stay safe.